Okay, we are back again. I think uh, this is the first time on the series we've had four parts to an interview, but there's certainly a lot of information to, um, to delve into here. So Danyar is joining us again. Uh, we're still busy going through the contents of his book. By no means have we been able to get through the whole book. Um, so I would urge everyone to download the book. The link is below. Um, it's very, very beneficial. A lot of great um, diagrams, drawings, uh, a lot of information. Um, so in this part, we're going to try to, to kind of cover and wrap up um, one of the other chapters, which is the thumb draw, thumb release. Um, and if we can also maybe talk about a um, little bit on horse archery as well and the horses of, of Kazakhstan. So I'm just going to open the PDF again and I'll hand it over to Danyar. Okay, I'll go to the okay. first image. Danyar, which, which uh, image do you want? The next one. Okay. Yeah. So uh, uh, just like all other horseback archers, we use thumb rings and thumb release. And these are just some uh, examples of uh, how it, what materials could be used. Uh, we can see leather and uh, this one is a synthetic material, kind of like plastic. Uh, so uh, I, I made all of them except for horn. This one is a horn. The, mm -hmm. the two on the bottom are leather. Mm -hmm. Yep. And uh, the yellow one is synthetic material. Some sort of plastic. Yeah. Right. And so uh, uh, my personal choice is leather. I don't know. Either well, maybe it's the nomad in me. Mm -hmm. I prefer natural materials, uh, softer mm -hmm. materials, but I tried all kind of uh, thumb rings and I'm most comfortable with leather one. Sure. And uh, I guess we can move to the next one. Yeah, this one just shows, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the images of how it sits on a finger, on a thumb, how it's supposed to protect. Uh, it might get very nasty. One time I remember I was shooting uh, for a few hours with a very thin leather, uh, leather thumb ring. And the next day, the entire leather pad, skin pad on my thumb just got off. And oh, I wasn't wow. able, I wasn't able to shoot, yeah. For for two weeks, I wasn't able to shoot. Oh, very painful. So it's yeah. Very important. yeah, it's very important to use a proper uh, protection. And uh, the middle row shows the difference between uh, between the, oh no, the, the middle one shows how you grab it with mm -hmm. your thumb and then you secure it with, uh, with the uh, uh, point finger. Yes. It's one of the options. I'm not saying this is the only one, but this is sure. the one I was using at that time. Sure. And the one at the bottom obviously shows difference between thumb hold, uh, yeah. thumb draw and finger. Yeah. 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 And by the way, I use uh, I I've, I often use the three fingers under. Mm. Uh, I know everybody use one one over two under, but I if if it sits snugly on a string. I sometimes prefer to use three under. Yeah, and I, I think the, the, um, the, the, the three under is, is, is what we call bare bow style and uh, probably more, more you know, instinctive. When they, have, when they have the split finger, it can be used with traditional bows, but then it's a little bit more into the kind of Olympic style as well. Um, but it can be used with, with uh, bare bows but um, many people like to use the, yeah, the three under, um, maybe because the fingers are more together, they have more, more strength together rather than if they're, if they're split. Um, one question, Danyar, you, yep. you're in your archery, um, in your time as an archer, um, have you had any teachers in Kazakhstan or elsewhere, or are you more like self-taught? I would say I'm 99% self-taught. <laughs> right 
Yeah. And, okay. and, and the reason for that, because at that time, uh, we didn't have any teachers here in Kazakhstan. We do have now, but I am the first generation uh, in Kazakhstan of coming back, of revival, of revival, right. of coming back right. of traditional yeah. archery. So me and all of my peers, we are all self-trained. Have you have you have you not been able to come into contact with anyone above or older than you, like someone over sixty or seventy or eighty, who in their childhood used to shoot or anything like that, or is that generation disappeared? That generation disappeared. My father told me that there was a an archer in his village who wow. was an old man and he was still using it, but he didn't pass it. He he didn't leave uh, any apprentices. Yeah, so, so sad. It, so sad. It was very, yeah, it's very sad. It was very close, but yeah. And to my knowledge, uh, uh, nobody surfaced yet who has direct lineage in Kazakhstan. Yeah, to my it's, it's very, yeah, it's very yeah. similar to the to the situation I think in in um, in Turkey. The the they call him the last Ottoman, Najmuddin Okiay, who was a very well known archer. Um, artist as well yeah. he did the ebru the painting calligraphy um he knew much of the of the quran etc etc uh but again because of the the times the political time he he was in um there was no one for him to pass on to which was uh which was, was, uh, was sad so i always use the example that us in in our time now in this in our generation we are trying to put the puzzle together but we don't have all the pieces, right? So we're, we're just trying to right, right. find any information we can to make the whole picture again. So this is this is our pursuit at the moment. Exactly. So the fact that we are coming into contact with each other, hopefully we exactly. are we are building more, uh, you know, part of the of the puzzle together. We hope. Yeah, it's funny you use puzzle analogy and I use shattered glass analogy. <laughs> yeah <laughs> uh, you know what i mean yeah. yes yeah yeah something similar but okay so no, they all have places okay so next page yeah yeah so this is just showing different holds uh between a longbow hold and a thumb again thumb release and the two pictures on the bottom uh show uh two different thumb ring thumb ring uh, draws okay. one is so-called mustache draw and the one uh, on the bottom is a shoulder draw mm. and shoulder draw is more uh, for example it's more uh, manchu mongol style because they have larger bows with, with yeah. those long long arrows they can pull it and uh, uh, sh with shorter smaller bows it's usually the mustache draw mm -hmm. Uh, next page yeah. uh, just shows it from the other angle. Yeah. And I, I want to point out that when you pull the uh, shorter bow, if it's built properly, see how it stretches back and it doesn't stuck over there. You can pull it very hard if it's built properly. Yes, and the one yes. I'm using, by the way, is Grozer. Right, right, right. It's, a it's okay. a very good bow. I love it. It's one of my favorite. Yeah. Is yeah. it is is that a biocomposite one or is it to... is it um, a laminate one? No, it's it, it's not laminate. I don't like laminate. I don't use laminate. But uh, it, it's it's some sort of synthetic. But it's uh, it's built so well. By looking at it, you wouldn't be able to tell how it's made. It's it looks yeah. uh, the shape wise, it looks identical and it performs very well too. And I right. think that's the, I would prefer to see all uh, modern bows uh, going in that direction as opposed to laminate. Right. But that's a different topic now. <laughs> yeah, indeed, indeed. Let's go it's, to the it, next it, one. It looks like your, your drawer is about at least 30, 31 inches, maybe something like that. Yeah, I have long hands. I can draw uh, over 30 up to 36, maybe. Wow. Yeah, okay. I have long hands and I have long arrows, yeah. Right. Now, uh, the one on the top here shows the, uh, the Manchu uh, bow type, the, mm -hmm. or as I call them, large Kazakh horse bow. Large Kazakh, yeah. And the one on the bottom, uh, 
is a long bow by comparison mm -hmm. just to see how it you know i even when i trim these images one of them is trimmed as landscape horizontal orientation and the one uh, with the long bow has a vertical orientation just to show yeah. how different it, it, it looks kind of yeah absolutely and also yeah. uh, in, uh the known about this uh i want to add uh, about these images you asked me earlier the the balls that i've built these two are mine and uh the one on the bottom is a long bow that i built uh i have more experience with those yeah uh, i've built quite a few of those and the one on the top is the one i've been uh, this is early stage when i was still experimenting right uh, it's not a it's not a horn bow i uh -huh. it, it was like a study bow like experimental i was when i was testing the shape and how it all works together right 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 so excellent uh, yep and that's kind of uh, uh covers that section uh i'm sure there is more information on the internet but this is what's uh, in my book and sure. uh let's move to the next section I think it's going to be interesting too. Uh, how to carry uh, mm. horse bow, and I write okay. uh, Kazakh horse bow, but this is uh, it, it goes to all uh, horse bows. Sure. At least starting from Middle Ages, and uh, this picture shows uh, the uh, the quiver be carried on the back, mm -hmm. but this is from uh, Persian times it's it's bc it's uh, it's yeah. very old yes and these are the only uh, these are the only images that i know of uh, about carrying quiver on the back mm -hmm. because i'm kind of uh, i'm one of those who are against uh, carrying quiver on the back you know okay. I, I, we call it hollywood style because none of the depictions show it this way right uh, right and it's not even it's not even very convenient. Uh, yeah, the, the, it's it's not as practical as having it, you know, elsewhere. Yeah. And it, it could be practical for certain, uh, uh, like, uh, uh, for certain stunt archery, mm, yeah. for certain tricks, it could be very convenient. But when you uh, study the entire complex of weaponry and equipment, it just doesn't fit in there. It's just, uh, it, it wouldn't work. So mm -hmm. if we go to the next one. Yeah. Yeah. So this one, uh, these are two period drawings. Uh, mm. These are like, uh, you know, photographs of that time. One of them, yes. the one on the bottom is a drawing by a, a Kazakh uh, geographer in 19th century. Ah. Uh, 1862 uh, to be exact and okay. uh, the one on the top is a is central uh, is middle ages uh, uh, central asian miniature mm. and they both show the same exact system when you carry uh, uh, bo both both uh, quiver and bow hol holster are sitting on the same belt and yeah. your if you are a righty your quiver will always be on your right hip and your bow holster will always be on your left hip. Right. And that's the standard uh, uh, composition. That's the standard way of carrying all the way from uh, Korea to Turkey and, and Persia, and of course, yeah. Central Asia and Kazakhstan as well. Yeah. So I want to point out that uh, if we, if we want to stay true to mm. tradition, we should carry it this way i'm not saying that if, if you're into some other type of archery uh i'm not saying don't do it because this is everybody's right to do it the way they want to sure. do it but if, if you're into traditional traditional archery then this is the way we all should be carried and mm. because uh this is the most practical way i've tested it in many many occasions this is the most practical way nothing gets in the way yeah. and you can still pull it anytime very fast mm. uh, i use it on competitions and i can walk for hours uh, i mean if you try carrying your bow in your hand or something mm. after a few hours it becomes like it weights you know 20 pounds yeah. or something sure yeah 
But if it's in a bow holster and your arrows are in, in a quiver, and it's mm. just, you, you don't even notice it. You can go for hours and hours. Yeah. And uh, let's go to the next one. Mm, uh, remember earlier you asked me if there is a distinctive Kazakh type of uh, quiver. Mm. So this is this is the one I uh, I draw in, in the museum, and it, it's very common in our region. The Bashkirs use the same type. Uh, so uh, the the bow holster is decorated in the same manner, and it covers like. Uh, almost two thirds of a bow and it's right. closed end. So if you see this uh, distinctive shape and these kind of patterns, this is mm. from our region. This is how it, it's different from say Turkish or Persian yeah. or even, yeah. Very beautiful, yeah. Yep, very uh, interesting. And, and I think it has this kind of uh, step flavor in it. It's kind of like- yeah, nomadic. It's different. Yeah, very nomadic. Yeah, it's different. All right, so um, let's uh, move to the section. If you wanna, uh, I, I I don't know if you wanna hear uh, about the female archers. Sure. That yeah. Why not? That that's that would be interesting. Yeah, we don't we don't often hear about them. Yeah. Yeah, because uh, uh, you know, female archery is on the rise. We have a lot of female archers in Kazakhstan and, and I think they're helping a lot uh, to carry this on. I, I personally support this uh, because uh, women are responsible for raising our children. Absolutely. And, uh, uh, yeah, go back one more. Oh. One more here? Uh, yeah, right here. So if, if they help us and to get, working together, we pass it on our children it will be much more efficient coming sure. from both parents, from fathers and mothers. Definitely. So anyways, uh, I'm sure uh, pretty much everybody have heard about uh, the myth of Amazonians or Amazons, Amazon women. And it's usually described in Greek mythology. And we can see depictions of them on the uh, Greek vases. Mm. Uh, it's it's in Greek uh, and Roman mythology, mm -hmm. but for a long time it was a, a it was considered a myth. But when, already when I was a child, uh, when I was teenager, I started hearing theories that uh, it could have been uh, nomadic women uh, of nomadic tribes, and that yeah. they could have been uh, like when their husbands went to war, uh, they would be patrolling their territories uh, because earlier I mentioned that they were also trained in military arts. So uh -huh. uh, in martial arts, so they could uh, perform patrolling duties, uh, defending duties, or they could even help uh, their men in battles as uh, sort of auxiliary forces, mm. light cavalry, light horseback archers. So those were the theories back then I'm talking like uh, 20 plus years ago. Yeah. But now we, archaeology advanced and we have more and more uh, solid hard uh, archaeological evidence when they find burials of female warriors and they're buried in the same manner as men mm. with their weapons, with their bows and arrows and their horses. So that myth is no longer a myth it's a now it is a fact it's mm -hmm. a scientific fact yeah and if we go to the next image wow very nice yeah this is kind of a uh, uh, artistic reconstruction of mm. a female uh, scythian or saka archer because that, mm. that's the period we're talking about mm. and yeah she she's shooting backwards mm. uh, as you can see, not using, not using stirrups too. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. pretty much uh, using the same technique as as all other archers. Even of the even she has even she has the follow through with the khatra there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because we we see that on some of the depictions of that period. Certainly. Yeah. yeah. They, they use khatra. 
Mm. And the, the bow type obviously is the skithin sure. type of bow. Excellent. And if we go to the next image, uh -huh. uh, this is uh, just um, a little homage, uh, homage to my uh, uh, fellow uh, war hero mm. women. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, uh, this is from World War II. Uh, yeah. The one on the top is uh, Alia Maldagulova, uh -huh. and she was a sniper. And the one on the bottom is Manchuk Mametova, mm. and uh, she was a machine gunner. Wow, amazing! And I find it I find it very interesting that uh, both of these female heroes are uh, uh, their 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 uh, their Warcraft was related to shooting. One of them is a sniper, which is sharpshooter, right? And the oh. one uh, on the bottom is machine gunner, which is artillery, uh, mm. archery, or related to artillery, archery, or just speed archery, like combat archery. So I thought yeah. it was, it's fascinating that uh, this kind of spirit, the, uh, this kind of uh, genetic memory, if you will, mm. got passed uh, through generations and and, and was still alive and used in the uh, 20th century. Yeah, amazing. We, we don't often hear of, of female uh, soldiers, you know, especially ones who are snipers and yep. machine gunners. Yeah, that was very yep. nice. And uh, this is uh, from uh, later times. This is a representation of uh, Kazakh mm. archers because we know that uh, this phenomenon uh, Kind of uh, came back uh, in in uh, recent centuries because there were some serious wars here between mm -hmm. the remaining nomadic states, and uh, at some point Kazakhs were losing; mm -hmm. uh, they lost a lot of men, so women had to step up and right. uh, became uh, yeah fighters next to their husbands. And this is from um, that kind of period. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, that's uh, for the uh, that's for the uh, uh, Amazons, for the historical Amazons. Yeah. Now let's uh, skip to the next image. We're almost done. Okay. There is just one one last section. So when I started uh, looking for information on how bows were made in Kazakhstan, mm. uh, we have written record that Kazakhs were building. Uh, they're both and importing, so both making and importing. Mm. But obviously, there is no, uh, uh, like I said, nobody surfaced uh, uh, who knows shooting, who knows archery or making or bow making right. in Kazakhstan. So I started looking for information, and um, there is almost none. So uh, I started looking at similar crafts, mm -hmm. trying to find. There is a connection like indirect connection because we have to when there is no direct information and this is like very too often is the case it's not like mm. in turkey where they have museums full of <laughs> bows and they have surviving right. many not right. like in korea where they when they have still have the the the, the bow makers uh, who who were trained by their fathers and grandfathers mm. We don't have any of that. So I have to look, be very creative looking for indirect links. So I started looking into yurt making. Do you, mm. you, know, you know, you know, the yurts, right? Yes. Yes. The tents. Yeah. The, our traditional tents. Yes. So I started looking into yurt making and uh, hoping that maybe I can find some information there. And this one, the photograph, uh, it's an old photograph shows a uh, yurt shop where they build yurts. And if you, we go to the next image, I found mm. in the museum the tools, uh, the yurt making tools. Wow. And I, I drew them. And anyone who makes traditional bows, uh, traditional way, immediately recognizes mm. that some of these tools are very, very, very similar. Yeah. The groover, yep. Mm. The, 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 the chopper, the cutter, the saw. Yeah. And especially, the, yep. And especially the the yurt making bench. Mm. Yeah. If you uh, go to the next one, 
Uh, one more, please. Ah, oh, wow, the, look at that. Yeah, the one on the top is showing uh, uh, Oriental Chinese, maybe uh, uh, arrow maker, but he's sitting on a bench that was very uh, similar to bow making bench. Mm -hmm. And as you can see, the, the, the second picture uh, of a man using this bench to bend the yurt parts using the same technique you know steam hot bending yes so so it's very very similar the the one uh, on the bottom shows how they heat them ah uh, and if we go back one yeah if we go back one more go back uh, to j j just a quick question here uh, daniel this skill of yurt making is this something that also has died out or it's still quite prevalent in the society thank god this one survived Thank right. God this one survived, yeah. But it survived very marginally. Uh, some Kazakhs in Mongolia do it, uh, mm. uh, and uh, some Kyrgyz in Kyrgyzstan. Right, right, right. It's now it's now coming back, uh, mm -hmm. but it's still uh, it's still very small, unfortunately. I wish it right. was bigger. Yeah, it, 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 it should like, it, it should it should be something that should be maintained as as, as much as possible. Exactly. 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 If we go back to one more, yeah. And this one shows how they were curing these bent woods. Yeah, right. Using these uh, pegs that hold them in place. And again, it's the same principle as uh, as uh, maturing the limbs. Curing yeah. Your bow. Yeah. After you after you achieve the the yeah the after you achieve the the lines the the curves, mm. you kind of rest it in a board with pegs the same way. Right, right, right. Interesting. Yes. Yeah. Indeed. So yeah. So, so by using this indirect uh, evidence, mm. uh, I believe I found, uh, in my opinion, hundred percent confirmation uh, that uh, it was used. Because if you can build a yurt, uh, definitely you can scale it down and build a bow. Absolutely. Right. Yes. Yes. So from my uh, perspective, I consider this uh, a proof, even if it's <laughs> yeah. indirect. Yeah, no, absolutely. Okay, so, it's it's uh, just it's just a, sm a smaller version, isn't it? Really. Right, right, right. Same technique, same technology, and mm. then you just apply the horn stripes uh, and and sinew. That's no brainer. That's easy. Yeah. And and that's it. You're done. So if we go to the last section, uh, I just want to finish. Sure. Yeah. So these are just some images. Uh, mm. um, yeah, I I just wanted to show uh, a few types of uh, bow sets. Yeah. Uh, bow kit uh, with quiver and bow holster and the thumb ring and, and mm. arrows and different types of bows. Mm. And uh, let's go to the next one. Have you have you had any experience, or do you, do you have people in Kazakhstan who? are uh, good at working with leather yes yeah. yes mm. uh not many but they're very very good mm. i wish and they can more. and they and they can make quivers and things like that yeah well actually i am one of them i'm one uh -huh. of them too yeah but there right. are, there are guys who are more advanced than i am right i am i'm uh, like uh intermediate maybe stage yeah, uh, but there are those who advanced much further than I, and, and they're really, really good. Excellent. Yep. And uh, uh, the one on the top shows uh, another type of bow and quiver, and then uh, the one on the bottom is uh, uh, is an image uh, reconstruction of a Kazakh archer. I, I, I like the fact that he's also carrying a sword as well. Is Was that um, very typical of the Kazakh ar archers as well? <clears throat> it's, uh, it was absolutely a requirement. Uh, we, have, uh, we have descriptions that if a man leaves a house without a weapon, mm -hmm. he would not be allowed to, uh, like, um, uh, he would not have a voting right. In other words, when the group when the group when the men of of a tribe would gather together to make a vote because it was a direct democracy system right 
when there was something important, some important decision to be made, all men gathered together and they had to vote, you know, make proposals and vote on them. So mm. if a man wouldn't have his weapon on him, he wouldn't be allowed in that circle. Right. So yeah. it, it really represented manhood. Having having a weapon on you was, was very key. Yeah, weapon also belt. Uh, ah. You can't. You couldn't leave uh, your home without a belt because it was it was it was considered sort of uh, you know al almost like be being dishonored or something, or, and, or, or, or a bit humiliating. Yeah, yeah. So uh, when they captured somebody uh, in in the war, mm. first thing they did they took off their belts, and that oh. was the sign. Yeah, and that was a sign that uh, they're kind of, uh, that's it, they're prisoners of war. Right. Sometimes they would uh, even, I believe, put them on the neck. Uh, and uh, I've read that uh, the, it, it wasn't sort of honorable imprisonment because uh, they wouldn't even try to run away. They would wait until they would be ransomed. Right. But otherwise, otherwise they would be fed with the family like uh, they wouldn't treat like like uh, they wouldn't treat much differently from uh, members of a tribe it was like a status you are a prisoner of war you're here waiting for a ransom and while you're waiting you do some work for us but once <laughs> right arrives you get your belt back and you you're a citizen again wow wow amazing so, yeah we have descriptions like this amazing and if we go to the next one so uh, this is a uh, uh, older male archer on the top, mm. uh, a little bit more wealthy. Uh, you can see from his horse uh, mm. equipment. Yep. And the one on the bottom is a uh, again a female archer, yes. archer, yes. probably hunting. And again, showing uh, all the horse equipment and everything. Yeah, I, I can see even the, the detail on the saddle is is a very yeah. different to the Western saddle, for example. Yeah, yeah. But uh, again, uh, all uh, all saddle designs trace back, originate back to early nomadic uh, saddle types. Right. And, you know, I, I studied the evolution you know, if, if, if I can, if you show me any saddle uh, today in any part of the world, world, I would probably show you where each part came from and wow. in which okay. period it was probably <laughs> right. originated. Yep. I've, I've, I've just noticed these two images are the same ones behind you on the wall. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, 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 this is the series. Very nice. Series. Very nice, very nice. And that's more images, more uh, reconstructions. Yeah. Uh, I studied uh, how equipment came together, horses, uh, mm. people, dress, because I don't, I'm not just uh, limited by archery. Uh, I want to replicate the entire ensemble, you know, including clothing and yeah, uh, all the suspension systems and and weaponry and etc. So, yeah, no, I can I can see you've put really put a lot of uh, you have a very <laughs> good eye for detail and a, a lot of um, a lot of work has gone into making sure that the finer details are correct. Which to the untrained eye, people will not will not pick up on that. But for people that know, they can see the differences in in the type of quivers, the boots, the um, the, the saddles the stirrups all these things so very well, nice at the same time uh, i must uh, like uh, a disclaimer here that no reconstruction is ever 100% absolutely of course we, of course we can only try our best and there there is always some guy who knows more than than yeah. you and sure. he will be like oh this is wrong this is wrong <laughs> yeah so yeah. <laughs> you know absolutely I, and I usually, uh, if, if the criticism is uh, to a point, if it's a constructive criticism, I always try to take it because I know that there are some 
very, very experienced, uh, uh, very advanced uh, reconstructors who know, you know, to, to the very tiniest detail. Also, I'm very limited in my sources. Uh, I told you mm. that uh, the museum wouldn't let me photograph or never mind touching it or watching right. it made up close. So I have to draw it wow. or I use imagery. Yeah, so I have okay. to, yeah, tiny little pieces that I collect and put together. It, it's kind of hard. Mm. Uh, Others can just go to their local museum and, you know. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, that, 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 that shows how much of an amazing job you've done just by oh, looking with, with, with the eye and, and trying to memorize that without even taking photographs. You've done a really amazing job. So, yeah, these are just more images, uh, different positions, mm. different shots. You know, this is the one on the, yeah, uh, it shows cartridge release, it shows uh, shooting artillery, archery, it, sh it shows shooting uh, enemy on the standing enemy uh, on the yeah. ground, mm -hmm. one on the bottom. So all kind of different uh, yeah. positions and shots. Yeah, uh, the, the so-called Parthian shot and right. the forward shot. By the way, if you want to hear another rant, I have another rant. Go ahead. <laughs> Why not? Why not? Okay. Uh, I'm very, I'm very bothered with the name of Parthian shot. Mm, why? Because, uh, well, once again, it's the same as the Crimean Tatar bow. Okay. Uh, there is absolutely nothing wrong with the Parthians. They, they were great, but they weren't first, and they were, they weren't the last. Mm. It's just that they were closest to the Romans. They fought with the Romans, and the Romans noticed how they. Uh, shot backwards mm. while fleeing, and so uh, they uh, they assume that this is the just the, this Parthians feature. But again, right. behind Parthians, Parthians was just the front line. Mm. Behind them, there was huge territory in, uh, filled with all kind of peoples and tribes. They are all used it, and you know. Uh, in my book, I say that we can all claim it as our own. It could be mm. uh, called Kazakh shot or, or, or you know, Mang Mongol shot or, or any kind of shot, you know, Bashkir shot, Kalmyk shot. Right. We all can claim it. Ottoman mm. shot. You know, anyone who used horse bow was familiar with this technique. And so we need to come up with a better name, I think, because, yeah, yeah. You know, I, I'm not Parthian, but I use it. So what, sure. what does it make me? <laughs> sure, sure. That's a that's a good question, actually. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Good question. It's it's again one of those Eurocentric uh, mm. things. And so uh, this is it. Let's just uh, one last thing. Sure. If we go to the sources. Sources. Uh, yeah. Uh, well, this is just a okay. quick Here one about, yeah, if we go to the sources, uh, I list uh, all the sources, well, most of the sources that I used uh, in Kazakh and Russian language and also in English language. Mm. And you will see all the familiar names here, Adam Karpovich, uh, Thomas Duvernay, uh, Stephen Selby, Kay Copperdryer, and etc. you know. Yeah. Uh, Mike Lodes, Excellent. Scott Rodell, uh, David Gray, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Excellent. Yeah. Yeah. I did, I did try to get an interview with David Gray. Um, Peter Baker. Yeah. But uh, it wasn't, wasn't, wasn't possible at the moment, but some of the others we, we've done, Mike Lodes, I remember he's an amazing guy, yeah. very, very interesting. Oh, yeah. K Copper yeah. Dryer. Wow. Just K and Yup, both of them amazing couple they've been very very helpful in um giving me links to their their sensei shibata in japan and, and many many other people um obviously thomas Deverne, stephen selby adam Karpowitz. i mean it's it's been a, a a real honor to be able to um to get them on video so i have actually been forwarding them the youtube videos that we've been uploading um uh -huh. and i've been sending it to them directly so that they have it I sent them your book. I sent them the other links. So um, oh, wow. 
the uh, the big giants know about you now, Daniel. Don't worry, you're, you're on the radar. Well, that's good because I, I spoke uh, very high of them in my book. Uh, there is a good. separate section, yeah, about my sources and I praise each each of the authors. Excellent. I yeah. also wanted to, to know that uh, anyone who is interested into studying uh, archery more could use this, uh, these pages as a source because it, it has all the important books listed in there. So this is mm. a great source for all of the archery scholars of our time so that they don't sure. have to look at anywhere elsewhere. It's all in one place, all of the important books. Excellent, so, uh, you know, excellent. Just wanted no, that's, to that's, that's, su that's, uh, that's super helpful, very, very, very beneficial. Um, just, yes. to, just to wrap up, Danyar, just tell us a little bit about um, horses because, uh, you know, a key thing with archery and horse archery, uh, we have to mention the horses. So uh, what can you tell us about uh, the type of breeds you have, how they were trained, uh, military training, anything like that from, from Kazakhstan? Sure. sure. Well, uh, first of all, let me tell you that um, even, uh, even though I was, uh, I, I was raised in the city, I'm a city boy, but uh, we are all required to know our ancestry in Kazakhstan. And we know our tribe's names. We know uh, our tribe's motto and our tribe's uh, insignia. The, the, it's called Tamga. Mm -hmm. uh, it's like a, uh, every tribe has its own insignia. Right. So uh, my tribe, for example, the, the motto of my tribe is Tulpar Argamak, which is the name of mythical horses, two names of mythical horses, super horses, so to speak. And, mm -hmm. and, and, uh, and the, the Tamgas, the, the insignia of my tribe also represent horse harness and horse saddle. So this is a very uh, personal subject for me. I, I, I love ho horses a lot. I've been drawing them uh, since my childhood. I studied them and uh, uh, answering your question, there are specifically uh, Kazakh uh, horse breeds mm -hmm. out here in Kazakhstan. Uh, they are actually called like this Kazakh horse and, and there, are, there, are few, uh, there are few types of them. For example, uh, closer to Mongolia where we border Mongolia, we have uh, a horse breed called Jabe. Jabe. Mm -hmm. And it's very similar to Mongol horse. It's right. you know, bulky, short, hand, short legs, big head, thick, uh, uh, thick neck, long hair. It's very similar, but it is mm -hmm. more suitable for our climate. It's also very uh, low maintenance. Uh, uh, it can survive harsh winters. It grazes on its own, so you, you don't have to like uh, supervise it very closely. Uh, it produces, uh, it, it's very, uh, it's very, um, it's not super agile, but it's, it has a great stamina and it can eat on, it can feed on wild grasses. So you don't, you don't provide pr pr practically anything for it. So it's a, right. it's a real step, step, uh, type of horse, very close to Mongolian. Now there are other breeds. Uh, 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 if we go to the West, uh, uh, Western nomads, uh, for example, Turkmen in Turkmenia, mm -hmm. they're famous for their uh, lighter horses, uh, taller, bigger, and much lighter, uh, much more uh, elegant horses, so to speak. So yeah. we have a breed, we have a few breeds that are mixed with those Turkmen horses. One of them, for example, is Adai horse. Uh, it's kind of uh, intermediate type between the Kazakh horse that looks like Mongol horse and the Turkmen horse. So it's, mm -hmm. it's a little, it's, it's more slim, but it still has the features of a uh, steppe horse. So there are quite a few breeds like this. And uh, I, when I 
uh, when I draw, when I paint uh, my archers, horseback archers, I always try to make sure that uh, I show this type of horse, not mm. uh, because some some uh, artists uh, are so in love, for example, with Arabic horses because Arabic horses are beautiful. Sure. Sure. So they sometimes go against historical accuracy and show Kazakh uh, archers uh, or warriors on Arabic horses, which could happen, of course, which could happen. Mm -hmm. But typically we would use our own because they're better suited for, for the climate. Of course. And so I always try to be truth to, you know, every detail as much as possible. And it, it was a big reward for me when one uh, person older than me, uh, a very good specialist, uh, he works in the museum and he saw my artwork and he said, you're the first artist who I've seen who's portraying the right horses. <laughs> wow, wow, very good. That was, that was the highest praise I could get because it only happened once, but his, uh, uh, his remark was like a gold for me that he noticed no. that I'm trying to, you know, uh, that this is what I've been striving for. Uh, as for the traditions, uh, horses, uh, are our satellites, our friends from, from the childhood. Mm. Uh, we, we are truly the horse people. One of the theories, that's another myth, by the way, coming from the, Greek, the Greeks, that the centaurs, mm. uh, you know centaurs, right? Half horse, half person. Yes. It is believed that uh, when they first uh, saw horseback riders, uh, it, it was just like, some to to a person who never saw it it was like i don't know somebody flying airplane or something right and so they they could have uh imagined that this is a sort of creature half half horse half person because right. it was just so unbelievable yeah. to them mm. to the westerners i mean and uh maybe this is where the the myth uh was originated mm. so uh since uh, we are part of this horseback culture here where it originated, we are also considering ourselves, uh, you know, horse people, horseback sure. nation. And you, you often read that uh, they, they, they would try to learn, teach their children to ride horse from the very, uh, uh, early on, age, age from age of two, for example, and it it's even says somewhere in some sources that uh, the Eurasian nomads learn to ride horse before they learn to walk properly. Mm, I've, yeah, I've heard this. I've heard this. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yep. And then uh, uh, at the age of two, they put them on a horse, and at the age of three, they give them their first bow. Wow. So. Can you imagine uh, hmm. you starting at such a, an early age? Yeah, and that's amazing. No wonder that, yeah, you, and you train all your life. And yeah. You don't do much else. You just, you know, perform it, uh, uh, perfect your skills. Mm. And no wonder then uh, uh, the, the step archers were performed better, especially considering that, and it's a proven fact that they had better vision because they grew up in the flat plains. Absolutely, yeah. To, yeah. From the early childhood, they had to learn to see very far away. Yeah. And, and uh, all of the geographers were amazed how uh, Kazakhs, Mongols, uh, Kalmyks, Bashkirs could recognize uh, another person before mm. Westerners could even see the person. But they wow. already can which person it, it is, you know, by name, yeah, yeah. <laughs> from which tribe and etc. Yeah. So combining all these factors together, early horseback training, early heart archery training, uh, better vision, uh, a lot of horses, obviously, no, absolutely uh, no shortage of horses. Mm. And that's what uh, builds this horseback nation. That, that is described by all neighbors that they 
uh, you know, show up on the battlefield, uh, mm. many, many horses, many, many horsemen shooting bows, <laughs> raining arrows. And then when you try to counterattack them, they just disappear. They, mm. they wouldn't. So uh, killing their enemies from the distance and not letting uh, mm. them uh, to return yeah. the favor. And then when the enemy is weakened, it, and it could last for days and weeks. Yeah. Only then they could, you know, hit them directly in a melee fight, sure. hand-to-hand combat. So yeah. And these tactics they didn't change uh, throughout millennia. Uh, mm. We're now usually when I talk about uh, the the age of nomadic civilization, I usually uh, say it's roughly three thousand years. Mm. maybe even more but i'm trying to be safe i'm staying on the safe side so it's three thousand years of confirmed nomadic uh, civilization existence and pretty much uh, everything that was invented in the early ages when it was just uh, establishing itself the, the nomadic lifestyle the nomadic mm. economy pretty much everything they invented there then existed till uh, beginning of 20th century and still does in some certain remote areas. Mm, For example, mm. we still have uh, uh, these remote villages where kids uh, ride their horses from early childhood and you know they can spend days on a horseback and etc. Mm. Uh, no archery, unfortunately, because we already discussed how it was prohibited. Mm. But it's coming back now, so uh, at least we kept the horse culture, which is which yeah. is great. Yeah, no, at least there is there is that which is um, which is key to 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 having you know at least it's one part of the of the balance of of, of horse archery. Right. You know, the horse is, is so is so pivotal uh, to that. Um, Daniel, what can I say? You've 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 really left me speechless. This is probably been one of the most fascinating interviews I've done and, and I've done you know a number of them with with many many uh, you know kind of well-known people in the archery world but I'm so glad that we have um, had the chance to come into contact with each other and I really do feel now that I kind of feel we have plugged a little bit of a hole in this puzzle yeah. as well um, yeah. um, because up until now that part of the the geography for us was was quite vacant and empty and um i'm so glad to see that you've really done uh, an excellent job in uh, your, your your book the research you know you're uh, a gifted artist which um is another excellent uh, skill to have um you know you're you're not just talking the talk you're walking the walk as they say you you're an, a horse archer and a rider and making the bows and everything so um I kind of add you to my list of of teachers now as well. So I'm very honored to to have uh, to have come into contact with you. Um, like I say, with many other um, people that I've interviewed, I hope that one day we one day soon this this COVID uh, pandemic will will dissipate and and hopefully we can come together face to face, um, either you know just one on one or as a group, and we can share this knowledge and share this information and share this uh, richness of culture and history and civilization with each other so that we can uh, learn to uh, be more tolerant of each other's um, cultures, nations, uh, religions, languages, um, practices and things like this. And we can really celebrate this um, amazing gift that we've all been given um, uh, like you say, archery and, and horses is the one thing that connects us all, even though we're in different parts of the world. Um, you know, we all recognize a horse when we see one. We all recognize a bow and we know what to do with it, even if we may not speak the same language. Um, our language is archery. Our language yes. is the horse. Yes. And, and yes. that's one of the, the real magical, mystical and I guess even spiritual things that, 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 we, can, that we can come together on, you know. Um, yes. So... I'm going to again encourage people who are watching this to download uh, Daniel's book and all of the the links below. Um, 
and um, I'm sure people may want to get in touch with you. So we'll give them contact details as well. Um, we'll put a link to your Instagram page as well. And we really want to give you as much um, uh, um, platform and exposure as possible, because I think you have so much to offer and so much information. Um, and, and like you said, you're, you're very humble in what you say that you know, we don't have all the information. We may not be 100% correct, but at least you've made uh, a we very educated. Can. Yeah, you're doing your best, but you've made a very educated uh, guess um, and uh, uh, in terms of uh, your your drawings and how things were at that time. Um, you know, it's 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 near impossible to 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 know exactly how things were a hundred, two hundred, five hundred, a thousand years ago, for example. But yeah. um, but I, I want to thank you. I appreciate all the work you're doing. Keep it up, please. Um, and I, I hope that we can um, come together again very soon. Well, let me respond to this. Uh, respond to this beautiful speech and uh, in our closure uh, I'm uh, I'm very honored uh, to have this opportunity uh, to have met you and to be on your channel uh, you are also uh, one of my teachers because I am learning some different aspects from you that I didn't know before for example now I'm uh, I want to study the, the religious aspect of archery. It, 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 I think it's covered uh, really well in your videos. I want to I want to study that too because I know I've heard about it, but I never really gotten the chance to study it better. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to do it now with your resource, and it's amazing. Not to mention all the interviews with my archery heroes and other peers, uh, ar archery fellows. So. Uh, I guess if I can, my, my, my main goal, if I have achieved something would be to bring my voice from our region, because usually everybody talk about us, but nobody's, there is no voice from within, mm. from the kind of internal understanding of the language, of the culture, somebody's living within this region. So that's what I was trying to bring to the table. Also, uh, uh, none of this would have wouldn't would have happened if uh, I wouldn't be standing on the shoulders of the previous uh, researchers, previous generation. I think it's their uh, uh, st striving for for knowledge, for for truth, for discovery that encouraged me uh, to do my work, and I, I borrowed a lot from them, and I try to acknowledge everything. Uh, that, that, that I did. So I, I tried to kind of uh, be, to continue what they started. Sure. So uh, that's, not, that's another one. Uh, yes, I think uh, your, your idea is wonderful. Maybe uh, when the connection is better, may, we can even organize like uh, group Zoom meetings or Good or idea. Something. Yeah, that's, that's one Maybe. option. Yes, we could do, yeah. Yeah, yeah. That, yeah. hopefully. Uh, the, the internet will get better globally because it looks like it's overloaded. So, <laughs> Indeed. And yeah, uh, like you said, uh, archery is in our genes. Uh, anyone, whoever held it in, in their hands would immediately know what to do with it. Uh, and this is our universal language. Good uh, only best shots, uh, good arrows, good bows, uh, good health, and high spirit. And hope we Excellent. will. I will meet uh, a lot of people personally too. For sure, for sure. We're gonna hopefully plan some things for the future, and and hopefully yeah. we'll have some type of. I'm just thinking at the moment we have some type of convention or meeting or something. But yeah. let let yeah. let's see what happens. But we'll stay in touch for sure. And. Um, I pray that you stay safe, stay healthy, and uh, until next time, we'll uh, we'll speak to you soon and take care. Okay. Thank you, my friend. Take care. Take care.